you are the one slowing it down. So what I, my challenge for you is this block time in your calendar where you are not allowed to work. And I'm not talking about finishing at four o'clock on a Friday or starting at 10 o'clock on a Monday. I'm talking about in the middle of the day, take three hours and block your calendar so you're not allowed to work. From 11 o'clock until two o'clock on a Tuesday, block it out, I'm not allowed to work. You can do whatever you want, but not work. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. To the Agency Hour live here in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. Look, I've even had a new haircut. I've got a new haircut just for you. Huh? They even put a little part in. What do you think? You like? You like him? You like him? This is uh, live in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. Welcome back to 2022. Today, we're going to talk about earning more by working less. That's right. This is not clickbait. This is not some fanciful uh, new kind of woo-woo, you know, black magic voodoo theory that we've come up with. This is a fact that if you work less, you will earn more. And I'm going to explain uh, during the course of this show. So stick around. And a big welcome to my co-host, my co-pilot, my partner in crime, my brother from another, Pete Crispy Butter Perry. Uh, Oh, look at that. Oh my Fantastic. God! Where did we get that picture? <laughs> you've even got your own. You've even got your own bumper now. Wow! I look, that's I look like I have gas. <laughs> well, dude, I mean, you just—that's how you look most of the time. So, you know. <laughs> we're gonna work on that picture. I think. Wow, we have bumpers. We have like animated I bumpers. Know, Max has awesome. been. That's awesome. Max has been <laughs> busy over the Christmas period, hasn't busy. he? Hey? Wow, well, uh, that's fantastic. Good to see you. I haven't, we haven't been on this together in. Uh, like a while. Well over a yeah. month, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Uh happy new year, brother. Happy new year to you. Good to see How's you. things working out for you right now where you are I'm in the world? Working out well, but I'm really interested in hearing how I can make more money and not work. Oh, easy. That's easy. always been my yeah. goal. Yeah. Well, you just you just put money in crypto. That's how you how you do it. That's oh, that's the answer. Go. You just put money in crypto and then you go play golf and you go to the cinema and then you check your crypto every day and it goes up. Isn't that how it works? That's how does you this, so whatever you're about to tell us, it works for agency owners, but does it work for heads of coaching too? Um maybe, maybe. So this is aimed at business owners. This is aimed at business owners. Um, hey, by the way, if you are watching this and you are leaving a comment and you would like us to bring your name and your face up on the screen, you need to give StreamYard permission to know who you are because of you know privacy and all that boring stuff. Uh so please do that. Oh, look at that. Please give StreamYard permission to share your name with a picture of a what is that? A pelican? Is that the stream? What is that? A seagull? What is that bird? Uh, what is it? A, a seagull. A, a duck. duck. It's a duck. Oh, there we go. I don't know my birds, obviously. Why is the StreamYard logo a duck? It makes no sense whatsoever. Anyway, um, so yeah. click the link and give StreamYard permission. Uh, and also let us know in the comments where you are from. Which country are you from? Where are you watching this? <laughs> Stop it. Max has been way too busy and has obviously got too much spare time in his hands and not enough real work to do, and has been building these bumpers for the agency hour. That's very, very special indeed. Um, hey, also, little announcement. We, I believe we have a launch date for the podcast for the agency oh, hour. Nice. I believe it's launching as a podcast on the 1st of March, which in my calendar is a Tuesday. So there we go. On Tuesday, the 1st of March, we're going to be launching the Agency Hour as a podcast. I think we have like 15 or 16 episodes in the can already, as they say. So that's going to be very exciting. You'll be able to listen to us rabbit on without actually watching us in the Facebook group. So that's uh, coming up. Cody Stinson is here from Greenville in South Carolina. Is that South Carolina, SC? South Carolina, yes. Go Tigers. There we go. Cool. Awesome. Um, so let us know in the comments where you are from and uh, which country you are from. And uh, let's dive into this. Uh, so here's what – there's two things I want to talk about today. There's the outcome and then there's the approach, right? And the outcome is we're going to talk about how to earn – how to earn more revenue by working less, right? And this is aimed 
fairly and squarely at agency owners. So if you're an employee, for example, this might be a bit tricky. So this is aimed at agency owners. Daniel King is here from Argentina. Well, there we go. Wow, nice. Um, so the, the, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And, and the approach that we're going to use to get there is called minimum viable effort, something I made up while I was camping, right? Uh, because camping is tricky when you've got a four and a half year old and a two year old, right? And uh, it's and we were in we were on an unpowered site in tents, so we weren't glamping. We were actually camping, and it can be very exhausting. And so you get very good very quickly at figuring out the minimum viable effort you have to you have to put in to get the desired outcome. So desired outcome typically when you're camping is food and sleep. Right, personal hygiene is optional. Okay, uh, and so you figure because it's exhausting camping. When you, we were lucky we had good weather, but when you're battling the elements and you've got kids running around, there were eight families camping all together. You got kids running around screaming and not sleeping, and no one's really sleeping very well. So you just got to do the minimum viable effort to get the outcome. And I want to, and I was thinking about you while I was on holidays, Pete, which is a little disturbing. But I was thinking about you learning how to play the bass. Oh, yeah. And the question I've got, and you sent me this great video, which we haven't got queued up, by the way. You sent me a great video of you playing the 12-bar blues on the bass, which yeah. I, I'm also obsessed with the 12-bar blues and when I discovered it, and I have been obsessed with it ever since. So I intend on making a video over your video and sending it back to you. I'm going to play some guitar. <laughs> <right here. laughs> That'll be fun. Uh, and we'll just keep No, we'll get, Adam, we'll get Adam some and add a drum track. Some, <laughs> correct. That's right. And then we'll make a record. Um, and so the what I want to ask you is this. When you're practicing the 12 bar blues, what is the outcome that you are aiming for? Oh, that's tough. Um, in my case, because I'm, I'm really very new to musical instruments of any kind and especially the bass. Um, I like, I think I'm like three and a half months in my real outcome right now is just to be able to show somebody like you, without being completely embarrassed. So show progress every day. I literally do um, work every day at it and I have a structured practice routine that I try to follow. Um, mm -hmm. And then some days you just kind of wing it, but um, I'm really just trying to see progress every day. And I actually videotape myself like that uh, every couple of weeks so that mm. I can see the progress and I have seen huge progress, even though it's obviously I'm mm. not anywhere near where mm. I would want the public to see. <laughs> but, mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? But yeah. So, so dude, like you played the 12 bar blues on the bass. You sent me this video and I'm like, holy shit, Pete's like been doing this five minutes and he just played the 12 bar blues on the bass. I was very impressed. Obviously you've been putting a lot of work in, but let's get granular here. When yeah. you, when you are practicing the 12 bar blues, what is the outcome that you are aiming for? When you are practicing the 12 bar blues, what are you hoping to achieve? Um, I'm not really sure what you're getting at with the question. You mean okay, so so when you're when you're practice when you're sitting down, you're practicing the twelve bar blues. You are the outcome that you want is you want to be able to play the twelve bar blues oh. on the bass yes. with a constant rhythm without making any mistakes and without stopping. You want to be able to get through right. twelve yes. bars from start yes. to finish without falling and over, with, right? With the right chord progressions, chord right. changes, and and the right the right rhythm groove, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, and mm -hmm. um, so and, and, whether, and, you're playing, and you, whether you're playing somebody else's pre-written one or the one that I did was just something I just made up real quick. Hmm. And you know you've done it when you get to the end of the 12-bar cycle yes. and you've played it and you've watched your hands hit all the right notes at the right time in the right place and you haven't made any mistakes and you haven't stopped right. halfway through. Like you've completed it, right? Right. So, and, nobody, and nobody downstairs is screaming for me to stop playing. There we go. Amber is here from South Australia. Thanks for joining in, Amber. We're talking about minimum viable effort. We're talking about how to earn more by working less, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. I'm actually going to prove this is a true thing. And we're talking about Pete learning how to play the 12-bar blues on the bass guitar. So, because so can I throw something else in? Please. Instead of practicing for three or four hours a day, or even three or four hours at a time, and then not practicing again for three days, I literally practice for 20 minutes every day. That's it. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yep. 
and I see more progress that way than than when I first yep. started. I was trying to do it a lot, like try to jam it all in. I think it's easier yep. just five minutes at 10 minutes, 15 yep. minutes, a little bit yep. at a time. Yep. Ness Brown is here from Melbourne. Hey, Ness, welcome to the show. Uh, for those of you watching, let us know where you are from in the in the comments. We are talking about minimum viable effort as a way, as a methodology and an approach to earn more while working less, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment. But the example I'm using is Pete is learning how to play the bass guitar, is learning how to play the 12-bar blues on the bass. And so the first thing the first thing here is when you sit down and practice the 12-bar blues on the bass guitar, the outcome is very obvious and the success criteria for that outcome is very obvious. Like it's I've just defined, played yeah. that this is what the 12 bar blues sounds yeah. like on the bass guitar. Right. So uh, I'm not going to get halfway through and go off into like a jazz funk improv right. thing because that's not the 12 bar blues. Right. So I, I'm, I'm, I am doing, I'm playing. What, what key did you play in? Was it in a, I think I started in G actually. Okay. Yeah, it was G. So G. We're, we're playing 12 bar blues in G. This is what it sounds like. We play the G, then we do the C, then back to the G, then we do the D, then the C, then the back to the G. And uh, that's, you know, me just showing off my uh, amazing musical talent. Musical theory. Uh, and knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is what it sounds like. And the six, so, so knowing what it looks like if it's successful is very obvious to everyone. Okay. It's like, and and you've all heard it. You've all you've heard, heard it. Every, you're like all familiar. You that's music, right. You've heard the pattern. That's right. It's like a it's like a basketballer. It's like Michael Jordan, right? It's very obvious what Michael Jordan's job is is to score goals, right? And it's and we know when that happens because the ball goes through the hoop, through the swish, through the net, and a two goes up on the board. Or in Michael's case, usually it's a three goes up on the board because he shoots three pointers. So. The success cri so the outcome is very clearly defined, and the success criteria for what that outcome looks like when it's successful is very, very clearly defined. There's no deviation from that. Okay, so that's step number one. Step number one is to clearly define the outcome and know what success looks like. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two is another question for Pete. While you are practicing the 12 bar blues, Pete, what else are you doing? Nothing. Ho, 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 ho. Now, you would have thought that I teed him up for that answer, but I didn't. While Pete is sitting there practicing the 12 bar blues on the bass, right, he's doing what? Nothing. He's not on Plugin Alliance researching plugins for the computer for the bass. He's not researching pedals, right, at the local music store. He's not He's not restringing the bass guitar. He's not cleaning the bass guitar. He's not fiddling with his amp. He's practising the 12-bar blues. That's all he's doing. He's not on social media, right? He's not multitasking. You can't multitask when you're playing the 12-bar blues. The only thing you might be able to do at the same time is tap your foot, to keep you in time. And I, I don't I don't see myself ever able to sing and play. <laughs> you know what? My, my 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 best mate Bart is a great bass player and also plays guitar and a bit of piano and is a good singer and a good songwriter. Can't play bass and sing at the same time. Playing bass and singing at the same time is really yeah, really it's easier to play much easier to play guitar, piano, even drums and sing at the same time, which I can do all three of those by the way. Uh, but playing bass and I can play a bit of bass but I can't play bass and sing. Yeah, play. Well, that was my first instrument. Uh, so it's really difficult to play bass and sing at the same time. But the point I'm trying to make is this. When you are practicing the 12-bar blues on the bass guitar, that is all you are doing. You're not doing anything else, right? So here's what I want to talk about in terms of what the hell has this got to do with running an agency. The first thing I think that is really important is – to understand what your job is as an agency owner and to have very clear outcomes that you are responsible for delivering and have very clearly written out success criteria for how you know you're doing your job successfully. Right? So I just want you guys to let me know in the chat, do you know 
what your job is as an agency owner, do you know the outcomes that you are responsible for as the agency owner? And do you know how you're going to measure those outcomes? In other words, have you got the success criteria written down? Let me give you some examples from our everyday life, right? I'm going to throw a party for my wife's birthday in a couple of months. And the success criteria, the outcome is we're going to have a great party and we're all going to get COVID together, right? That's the outcome that I'm aiming for. And, and the success criteria is that a bunch of people will turn up to our house, uh, we'll go out in the back deck, there'll be lights, there'll be a, uh, a, a, a marquee set up in the backyard, there'll be some instruments on the back deck, we'll have some live music, we'll all get drunk, we'll all wake up the next day with a hangover and COVID. That's the success criteria. That's the outcome that we're aiming for. I'm joking about the COVID thing, right? So very clear to me, I work, then work backwards and go, what are all the things I need to do over the next eight weeks to make that happen? I need to send out invitations. I need to organize some catering. I need to book some live entertainment. I need to organize a sound system. I need to get the marquee up. I need to enlist some help from my, I just write it all out and click up and put together a project. And then I just go off and tick it off because the success criteria is very obvious, right? I need to warn the neighbours that we're going to be making some noise, but, you know, by midnight it'll all be done because we're old. We're not going to be partying until 4 o'clock in the morning, so there's no need to call the police. Uh, that was her 30th that we had the police <laughs> called on us, and that's a true story. We did. We had we, They shut us down at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'll, I'll be well in bed by then. Um, so the, the success criteria and the outcome is very clear, and then all I have to do is reverse engineer the steps that I need to take in order to achieve the success criteria. So thinking about your role. Now, I also want to just talk about if it's just you in the agency and you're the only one that works in the agency, then I want you to think about all the stuff that you need to do to serve your clients. But then I just want you to kind of park that and go, all right, other than that, what do I need to do as a business owner to grow my business? What outcomes am I responsible for? So please let me know in the chat. Do simple yes or no answer. Do you know the outcomes that you are responsible for as an agency owner? And do you have success criteria written out for those outcomes? In other words, do you know how, do you know when you've arrived? Do you know how you're, do you know if you're doing your job successfully as an agency owner? And it's okay. There's no wrong answer here. There's just the truth. Okay. You either do know it or you don't. If you don't, that's okay. That's why we're here. We're here to help you. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some ideas and give you some, um, give you some, some guidance here. Okay. Amber. Yes. Okay. Wake up call here. That's what we're here for. Amber. And, and, uh, and, uh, Ness. Yes. I know the outcomes, but no real success criteria. Excellent. Excellent. So you're going to give us some examples? I am. I'm going to give you some examples. Right. Yeah. I don't want to push it. Just want to make sure. Well, there are, <clears throat> I think there are, um, here's, here's what, here's what I think are the outcomes that an agency owner is responsible for. The, as a business owner, your number one responsibility is to stay liquid right? What I mean by that is your number one responsibility is to not run out of money. That is responsibility number one. Do not run out of money, okay? Because if you run out of money, you're fucked. You can't pay anyone. You can't pay your staff. You can't pay your bills. You're out of business. So do not run out of money. Rule number one, do not run out of money, okay? Uh, responsibility number two is to stay profitable, and I said this before, I'll say it again, you owe it to yourself as a business owner who's taking all the risk for running and growing a business. You are taking all the risk. If it fails, it's your reputation, it's your pride, it's your, if you declare bankruptcy, you can't start another business for three years. That's kind of the rules here in Australia. Like you are taking enormous risk starting and growing your own business, Okay. So you owe it to yourself to be profitable. You deserve to make obscene amounts of profit from your agency. I'm going to say that again. You deserve to make obscene amounts of profit from your business as the business owner. 
There is no, you cannot make too much profit from your business, right? What you do with that profit is entirely up to you, right? We have, we have people in Mavericks Club who, who buy cars and also uh, put money into building orphanages, right? Well, whatever you want to do with your money is entirely up to you, but let's, let's be clear about this. You have the right to make obscene amounts of profit from your business. That is your right. There is no, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty about making lots of profit from your agency. Okay. Whatever you need to work through. And I know this is confronting for some people, whatever your relationship is with money and whatever you need to work through to redefine that relationship, I would suggest that you do that work around your relationship with money, but you have the right to make lots of profit from your agencies. Nothing wrong with that. The more profit you make, the more you can do in the world and the more you can look after your family and your team and yourself and the more you can give back. So we are, I'm all about creating abundance, okay? And you can't share your abundance if you are not making filthy amounts of profit from your agency. So rule number two, make lots of profit because that is what will you'll be able to reinvest back into the business. You'll be able to reinvest back into your team and you'll also be able to look after yourself and your family as a business owner and you deserve that. Okay. <clears throat> so number one, don't run out of money. Number two, stay profitable. Yeah. Number three, and this depends on what you want to do with the agency, but it, like there's, there's, let, let's just talk for a minute about the, typical outcomes for an agency at the end of the life of an agency, right? So full transparency, I'm 48 now. I know it's incredibly difficult to believe that, but I'm 48 right now. And uh, I am thinking about what I want to be doing in my mid to late fifties. Right. And some of you might, that, for some of you that might be like, well, I'm not even thinking about that because I'm in my early thirties and I'm immortal. Okay, well, I'm, I'm telling you that's not true. At some point, you are going to want to think about what you want to do with your business and how it fits into your life. And at some point in the future, <clears throat> you are going to not want to run your agency anymore because you'll just be tired yeah? and you'll want to do something different. And at that point, <clears throat> you've, got a, you've got some choices. One, you can sell the agency. Very tricky uh, to sell agencies, by the way, it's a very tricky business model to sell, but it can be done. It happens every day of the week. Agencies get sold, bought and sold every day of the week. Okay. So you can sell your agency Two, you can hire someone to run it for you and you can just step back and be a shareholder. So you don't actually work in the agency. My buddy Dave did this with um, one of his businesses before he then sold it. He actually stepped back. He employed someone to run it or he elevated one of his team members to run it. And he just became a shareholder. So he would just meet with the CEO once a month and advise and give guidance and based on his experience, hey, this is what I would do, try this, try this. They would hit the numbers. The CEO would get bonuses for hitting the numbers. He was the owner of the business. Uh, he would just get a profit dividend every three months from the business. And then at some point he sold the business, right? So that's another option is you just step back, you become a shareholder, you take a profit out of the business every three months as a dividend and the rest of the time someone else runs it and you can go play golf or hang out with your kids or start scrapbooking, whatever you want to do. I don't care, travel, whatever, right? <clears throat> the third option is you continue to run the business and extract as much profit from it as you possibly can. Use that profit to build your wealth through whatever you want to do, property, shares, crypto, I don't care, whatever, right? And then at some point you just shut it down and you go, well, I'm done. And you walk away because you've got enough money to retire and you don't need – the stress of running the agency anymore. Okay. So there are your three options really is you sell it, you hire someone to run it and you just become a shareholder or you just shut it down. Okay. Make sense. So any of those options is going to require a, a, a part, like unless you want to just shut it down and walk away from it, which I think is the worst option, by the way, yes, I think that I think the two best options are to have someone else run it and you just be the shareholder or to sell it. Now, selling it's tricky. So typically, uh, I think the sweet spot is elevating a team member to take it over and run it for you with the idea that it's then going to become that team owner's, that team member's business, right? This, my voiceover agent did this. My voiceover agent 
she wanted to get out, which is essentially an agency model. She wanted to get out of the agency. She wanted to retire. She had a girl working for her who was really good. She elevated her to general manager. Catherine ran the agency for about three years and then eventually bought it off Kathy. And now Catherine still owns it and Kathy retired, right? So that's very typical kind of model. Any of these options are going to require the same thing. They are going to require that the business be able to generate revenue, deliver value, and create a profit without you, the business owner, actually being involved in the day-to-day, right? Because if you can't do that, then you haven't got, you, you know, you haven't got anything that you can pass on to someone else or you haven't got anything that someone else can come in and run. So you need to build your team around whatever size that is, whether it's three or 33, whatever size team, you need to build a team of some description to deliver the value that you're promising your clients and to generate a profit for the company without you actually being in the building. Okay. So I think your third priority as a business owner is to build a great culture for your team to flourish and empower them to go forth and conquer without you. Make sense? Yes. And so is that really, so how would you word the third outcome then? What's the actual definition of the third outcome? Well, the third outcome is, is that the team are running the agency without you. And the success criteria is there that, you know, you are checking the business and seeing revenue and seeing profit and you're not involved, right? You just check the numbers, you know, and maybe you consult with the team once a month to kind of keep them on track. And as a shareholder, you go, well, you know, like you become a board member then. Here's what I would do and try this and try this. Here's what, you know, here's what used to work when I was a dinosaur, you know, when I was running the business, now I'm a dinosaur. I mean, you guys make decisions without me all the time now. Yeah. Because I don't think I'm going to make very good decisions. Yeah. Right? Better ones. Because we make, we make better ones, actually. Right. Because, because I've got so many, I've got so many things on my plate. I, uh, I sent Pete a message last night actually saying, if I make decisions right now in the business, they're going to be fast decisions because I want the decision off my plate and that's not going to be the best decision. So you guys make the decisions, spend some time thinking about it and make better decisions than me because I'm just going to decide something just to get rid of it, right? Because I'm going to think about other things. Um, so number one, stay liquid. Don't run out of money. Number two, stay profitable. Number three, empower your team. To make decisions that third one's you. a lot harder to reach than the first two yeah 100 yeah, percent. that's, it's, the, it's, that's it's, the golden it's, ticket right there totally Literally very totally. difficult if you build your team to make decisions and run the business without you you that's the only way to actually get out of the business and still have it be profitable right is to get your team to do things for you here's where i want to pivot the conversation now to how to get there? What is the minimum viable effort? What is this approach in order to get there? And how will the minimum viable effort allow you to make more money? Well, here's, here, you know, we, there, there's, a, there's an old saying, I'll, I'll get you guys to finish this sentence in the chat for me, right? My best ideas come to me when I'm blank. My best ideas come to me when I'm blank. It sounds Feeling, like a game show. We should have some game show music right but, now, Max. You know, it's funny because <laughs> I, we're running a webinar in an hour from now and we've got over 420 registrants on this webinar, which is amazing. Proof. Here, here we go. Case in point. If I made a decision in this business, I wouldn't run webinars because I thought webinars were dead. Our CMO, Tisu, who's a legend, says, no, 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 we're running a webinar. I'm like, okay, just tell me what to do. Uh, they did everything. I just built the slides. I'm going to turn up and present the material. And over 420 registrants, right? Now, pff, man, webinars are not dead, uh, which is a good thing. So, um, and on the webinar, we're going to play Jeopardy, which I'm so excited about. I'm super excited about playing Jeopardy on the webinar. So make sure you join in for that. My best ideas come to me when I am in the shower. That's right. Why? Why do your best ideas come to you when I'm in the shower? or when you're meditating, or when you wake up, or when you're not thinking about the business, or when you're taking a walk around the neighborhood, or when you're cooking. What's common about all of these scenarios, Pete? Not thinking about the business. 
not thinking about the business and also you're not looking at the internet right and you're not on this yeah right you're you've got you're some detached. distance yep you've got some distance trying to listen now while getting the kids to childcare I hear you, Amber. It's okay. The good thing is that Mark Zuckerberg's minions miraculously record these calls in the Facebook group and you can come back and watch the replay later. So uh, my best ideas come to me when I'm not looking at the computer and not touching the keyboard or the mouse, okay, when I'm doing something else. So here's the challenge for you guys. What I And most people approach this by saying, I'm going to take, you know, when the business, if I just get the business to this, which I'll talk about that in a moment, if if, if we can just achieve X, then I'm going to take every Friday, every second Friday afternoon off and give myself a little reward and have an early minute and go hang out with the family. If I, but first I have to get the business to this, right? So what we do is we flog ourselves, Right in front of the computer on the keyboard to get the business to this magical X that we need to get it to, whether it's a certain revenue level or we just need to hire a project manager or whatever. We just need to get this stuff off my plate and then I can take every second Friday afternoon off and go and hang out with the kids. Here's my challenge. My observation is that's not going to happen because you'll never get to X, right? You are the one slowing it down. So what I, my challenge for you is this block time in your calendar where you are not allowed to work. And I'm not talking about finishing at four o'clock on a Friday or starting at 10 o'clock on a Monday. I'm talking about in the middle of the day, take three hours and block your calendar so you're not allowed to work. From 11 o'clock until two o'clock on a Tuesday, block it out, I'm not allowed to work. You can do whatever you want but not work. Okay. One day a week. <clears throat> I would, I would encourage you to do it more than one day a week, okay. but minimum one day a week. Minimum, minimum. I mean, my friend, James Shremko doesn't work Tuesdays. He's like, I don't work Tuesdays. He comes back to work on Wednesday and he says to his team, what broke? Ah, oh, well, this broke. He goes, okay, well now that's what we need to fix. So that doesn't break again right? Three days a week, I don't work. That's fantastic. Well, that, does that include weekends though? <laughs> that includes weekends. I'm going no, to- no, if that's, if that's three days, if that's three, you know, if that's three work days, that's good. I've booked out every six weeks. Cassandra, what does that mean? You've booked out what? You've booked out a, a week every six weeks. You've booked out a day every six weeks. What is that? Now here's, here's, here's where the minimum viable effort thing comes into play, right? <laughs> If you, the more time you book out of your calendar where you're not allowed to work, the less opportunity you give yourself to faff about while you are working. So the less time you have to get things done, the more focused you will be at getting it done. It's Parkinson's law. If I say to you, you know, here's an online course that we're giving you and you've got six weeks to get through it and at the end of six weeks, if you haven't finished it in six weeks, we're going to charge your credit card five hundred dollars. Well, guess what? You'll make sure you get through that course in six weeks. If I say to you, "Here's the same course. You've got six days to get through it," and if you don't get through it within six days, and we'll track it, if you don't get through it, we're going to charge your credit card five hundred dollars on day seven. Well, guess what? You'll get through it in six days. If that course is actually three hours worth of content, and I say, "Here's a course. I'm going to give it to you for free, but you have to get through it in six hours." If you don't, we're going to charge your credit card $500. Guess how long it's going to take you to do it? Six hours. Because you've only allocated six hours to do the course. If you allocated six weeks to do the course, you'd fuck about for five and a half weeks and then get done the night before. Right. Right? What's the Parkinson's law? law. Parkinson's law, yes. Parkinson's law. It will take the time you've allocated to complete the thing. Yep. Right? So – What I'm suggesting is that you allocate less time to complete the thing. And then based on the fact that you've got less time, you, what I'm then suggesting is that you look at everything that's on your to-do list and ask yourself as a, 
as a business owner, what is the most important thing I need to do on my to-do list? Now, if you are too swamped with client work to think about being a business owner, it's time to hire someone so that you can spend more time focusing on the activities that you need to focus on as a business owner, profit, team, making sure you don't run out of money, right? So that making sure you don't run out of money and being profitable is typically going to be doing more sales activities, talking to more clients, bringing more clients on, building your team to deliver, okay? You don't need a massive team. Don't get scared. Don't freak yourself out. You know, three or four people on the team, part-time to begin with is enough to get started. So now that you've got less time to work, you have to get smarter about the work you do during that time. And once you've got a couple of people on the team who are really good at what they do, they will start making better decisions that will generate more revenue for the business or they will free you up to deliver the thing so you can then go generate more revenue. Does that make sense? So we've, we've got someone, we've got people in sales that do a better job than me in sales. So we're going to make more revenue. We've also got people who are better at delivering the thing than I am and making decisions. So I'm freed up to then think about the next salesperson we're going to hire and the next marketing campaign and working with the CMO to make sure that we're running the marketing campaigns to get the leads and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm really freed up more so than ever now because we have someone in marketing and sales and coaching and delivery. And I'm thinking more about products and how, what we can offer our community, which is going to make us more money because I'm thinking about more product, right? And what I realize is that if I give myself eight hours a day in the office, I'll spend about three or four hours doing really good work and the rest of the time just goofing off on the internet and going down rabbit holes I don't need to go down. So the minimum viable effort is thinking back to your, your, your 12 bar blues on the bass guitar. I now have less time in the calendar to work. What is the activity that I need to do? What is the minimum viable activity I need to do to achieve this outcome based on the success criteria that I've written out? Well, guess what? I just need to sit down for 20 minutes and play the bass. I don't need to look at pedals. I don't need to look at bass guitars. I don't need to look at bass software. I just need to sit down and play the bass for 20 minutes and I'm done. And over time, I look back on this in three months later and go, wow, check this out. Look at my progress. Look at how much progress I've made by just playing the scale for 20 minutes every day. Right? If you gave yourself eight hours to play the bass every day, you probably wouldn't make any more progress. You'd probably go backwards. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Because you just goof around. Yeah. Is this making sense? Let me know in the chat. Is this helpful? Very much so. Cassandra <laughs> takes one week every six weeks. That's awesome. Let me know in the chat if this is helpful. Let me know if you've got any questions in the chat. I'm sure you have questions. Let me know in the chat if you have questions and what questions you have. Um, I'll say this again. If you are too busy to think about business owner activity because you've, you're swamped with client work, it's time to hire someone, okay, to help you deliver the thing, right? If you're running social media campaigns for clients and you're just smashed and you can't think about growing the business, it's time to hire someone to help you run social media campaigns, right? And this is a good question from anonymous Facebook user, Andrew Litchford. I'm swamped, but if I'm not working billable hours myself, how can I afford to hire someone and still pay myself? Is it a margins game? I have to spend most of my time doing client work and don't spend hardly any time on sales or anything that I should be as a business owner. I also can't afford to take time off because I'm not able to bill for that time. Okay, this is a great question. It's a really common question and thank you, for, thank you for asking it, Andrew, because I promise you there's a lot of people who are thinking – the same thing and I kind of feel like they're stuck in the same cycle, right? So here's, let me tell you what I know to be true is that the more time you put into sales and marketing, the more clients you will close if you have a good sales process in place and you have a good offer for a good target audience and you do good work and you get results for your clients and your clients are happy. If you put, if you don't put dedicated time into sales, your business won't grow. 
Well, it might, but you'll kind of plateau. You'll only get to a certain point. You'll never be able to afford to hire someone. So if you hire someone, even part-time initially, to take over 40% of the work that you're doing, 40% of the client work that you're doing, you've then just freed up two days a week, 40%. You've freed up two days a week to concentrate on sales and marketing, right? So my mantra is this, always be marketing, always be selling, always be recruiting. It's the only way to get off the awful treadmill cycle of time for money. Because that's at the moment what you're doing is you're just trading your time for money, right? You're, you're, I don't know where you are in the world, but you're either a registered Actually. business or an LLC and you're just paying yourself. To, it's just an hourly rate. I have, right? a, I have, I have what I call a Pete-ism for that. Mm -hmm. Never trade time for money because there isn't enough time to make enough money. That's right. I love it. It's so good. And so there is not enough time to make enough money. That's right. Never trade time for money. So, um, so Andrew, the challenge that you've got here and you've said it yourself is you, you can't afford to take time off because you're not able to bill for that time. So you're, so if you continue doing what you're doing, your future then says the future that you're creating for yourself is a future without holidays without time off, without traveling with your family, without doing the things that you want to do with your life. That's the future that you're creating for yourself right now. You, you know what, dude, let me tell you something. In all transparency, you're better off getting a job because with a job, at least you get in Australia, you get four weeks of paid annual leave. In the States, you get two weeks of paid annual leave, right? You're hard people over there. Only two weeks of paid annual leave. You're hard people, right? So- you're better off getting a job. You get some benefits, you get your health insurance, you get four weeks annual leave. Stability. Right, pay, right? So it's uh, the future that you're creating for yourself right now, if you, keep what, if you keep doing what you're doing right now, is horrible. Yeah. So <clears throat> it is a margins game. You need to, and let me walk you through the math here in a, in a second. But before I do that, the mindset is this. You need to make a decision at some point whether or not you want to be a business owner or if you just want to be an employee. And if you don't want to be a business owner, you should just go and get a job. There's more benefit to having a job than a business owner doing what you're doing because, you, you, you know, like a solopreneur business owner, unless you are so good at what you do that you can charge 10 times what the market charges and your margins are so ridiculous because you're so good at what you do, right? And if you can charge $100,000 for a logo, happy days, right. right? There's very few people like that in the world. But if you can, and, then and great. None of, none of those people say they don't have enough time to do something else. Right, that's right. right. Because they're not, they're not spinning the wheels constantly. Right. So you want to stay a company of one, that's great. You just need to charge way more than the market is charging so you can make enough profit, put that profit aside into an account so you can take time off and have a holiday, okay? The alternative is you hire someone to do what you do and the margin works like this. Whatever it – now, now, when you hire someone, you become a business owner, whatever – so don't, you know – a lot of people start out by just hiring for other freelancers, which is fine. It's a low risk way of doing it. Whatever it costs you to build something, I'm going to pretend that you're building websites because I don't know enough about your business right now. Feel free to tell us in the chat. I'm going to pretend you're building websites. If, it, if another freelancer charges you $1,200 to build a website, and you're and and you've got the someone else has done the designs and you've got the designs and the client's giving you the designs and you're going to give the designs to a freelancer and they're going to charge you twelve hundred dollars to build the website. You need to sell that website to your client for at least thirty six hundred dollars right. if they're charging you twelve hundred bucks to build the website. If a freelancer is charging you twelve hundred bucks, if I said to Pete, "Hey, but I got this design here. Can you build this website for me in Elementor?" and he goes, "Yeah, no worries. Uh, you know, we're going to charge you two and a half grand." I go, "Great." I now go back to the client and I need to sell that to the client for seven and a half grand. I need to make three times what Pete's charging me. So whatever Pete charges me, I need to multiply it by three and that's what I'm charging the client. Okay. Same when you bring on stuff. That, that doesn't matter if you've got freelancers or if you've got staff. 
Typically speaking, you won't make as much margin if you're using freelancers than if you're using your own staff. Typically, you'll be able to make more margin if you're using your own team, right? So whatever it costs you to build something, you need to charge at least three times to the client in order for there to be enough margin because let's run the numbers here. Pete charges me two and a half grand to build a website. I'd sell that for seven and a half grand. Two and a half goes straight to Pete. I'm left with five. Two and a half of that five runs the business, pays for my insurance, my rent, my electricity, my, you know, Software. my water bottles, my sparkling water on tap, you know, my whatever, my coffee machine, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. My books. And then the remaining two and a half is my profit. Okay. That two and a half, the middle two and a half, by the way, might pay for my project manager, Slack, ClickUp, right? G Drive, whatever. And then the remaining two and a half left over is my profit. Okay. There you go. I always charge more simply because they want more guidance and expert consultations throughout the project. Exactly. So you're getting paid for strategy, which is exactly what you should be getting paid for, Thomas. <clears throat> Andrew Litchford does web development. Great. So if you do web development, you need to hire a developer, dude. Right? You need to hire a developer and you need to hire a developer and be able to charge three times what they cost you. So if a developer is going to cost you 50 grand a year, I'm going to make numbers up here, right? If a developer costs you 50 grand a year, that developer needs to be producing $150,000 a year worth of work in revenue. Okay. Make sense? Very much. Questions? Sparkling water on tap. Sparking. Sparking water on tap. New office goal. Yes. I must say I've learned a lot from you when I started nine years ago. Who said that? Thomas. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, well done. So, you, so wow. You've been around nine. You've been around our ecosystem for nine years, Thomas. Wow, that's amazing. That's, uh, uh, that's longer than me, boss. <laughs> yeah, Belinda says makes sense. Good, good. Any any questions? Do you guys have any questions about this stuff? <clears throat> what are the action steps? What are you going to do with this? Uh, I'm going to go figure out if I'm profitable. I'm going to make sure that I'm liquid. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to figure out how to uh, get the team to take on more and more and more. So the team, when it comes to team, one of the things that uh, we encourage our clients to do, and Pete actually built this, built this was the is to build an org chart, a future facing org chart. Right. So work out your sales targets, work out your revenue targets, work out, you know, uh, how what your team needs to look like in twelve months' time, and you might occupy multiple seats in that org chart for the time being, right? So James Murgatroyd, you might be doing sales, you might be doing project management, and you might be doing development, okay? And you might be doing the bookkeeping. First thing you should get rid of is the bookkeeping. Go and find a good bookkeeping service to handle your books, right? Second thing you want to delegate and hire for is the production of the stuff that you're selling. So designers, developers, SEO, social media managers, whatever, the, that's the second thing that you want to hire for. The second layer of roles in your org chart is the production of the stuff that we're selling. So that's who you want to hire for. The, the next role you want to hire for is the project management or the account management level, right? And then the last role that you want to hire for is the sales role. That's typically the last seat that you will occupy as the business owner is the sales role. Once you've hired salespeople, you've got project managers, you've got your production staff, you see the future here, you're like, I can piss off to, you know, Greece for four weeks with my family. And then ultimately, if you've got a really good project manager who can double as an ops manager, or at some point you end up with an ops manager. So you've got an operations manager, project manager, production staff, right? Bookkeeper taking care of everything. Yeah. And what I don't need to be here. I've, you know, I've so I had a, a maverick the other day on a call say to me, You deserve to take more time off because you've created the inertia. Oh, good word. Isn't it? 
Yeah. You've created this inertia in your business. You now just need to let your team continue on with that inertia and you deserve to take more time off. Right? So that, you know, and that's just about having the right people in the in the right seat. So that or if you don't have an org chart, if you don't have an, a projected org chart for 12 months time, you need that's one of the first things you need to do is go, right, what do I want my team to look like in 12 months time? Don't freak yourself out. Right? It's like hiring people it's not, I mean, it's hard work, sure, but I mean, what, what's the alternative? The alternative is that you just stay on the treadmill, right? You should just go and get a job, okay? So you don't need to hire everyone right now. You just need to hire, like, who's the next person that you're going to hire? Yeah? Sheila Heard. <laughs> you're doing fine, Sheila. <laughs> you can watch the replay. It's good. Um, set targets. Build your org chart. And then block time in your calendar where you're not allowed to work. Because when you're not working is when things, when ideas come to you, right? Is when, you know, watch the replay. It'll, you, you'll, you'll get it. Um, question here from uh, Abel Smith. What's number one on your suggested reading list for someone who needs this different mindset when it comes to profit? Uh, yeah, look, you know, I have some thoughts about profit first. Um, and I'm actually meeting with a profit first specialist this year because I, I'm, I look, I think profit first works to a certain point. Yeah, I think absolutely. that's been proven actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can get tricky once you get past a certain point. I think, I think it can get tricky, but anyway, I'm, I, I will, I'm looking forward to being wrong on that. I'm meeting with a profit first specialist uh in the next couple of months to kind of try and go deeper on this but in terms of just the mindset around money my number one go-to book when it comes to like being okay making filthy amounts of money and and even even saying that i go well what's filthy about making money right i mean that people uh, people say oh you're filthy rich why are they filthy right. rich why aren't Disgusting they just rich? rich yeah like why aren't they just rich there's nothing wrong right. with having lots of fucking money there's nothing wrong with that, right. right? So the number one, my go-to required reading for this is Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Oh, yeah, of course. That's the that's right. the classic baseline. Like, If you haven't read Think and Grow Rich, go read it. If you have read it, go read it again. Go read it again, yeah. It's like, you know. Which and, is, I and, should go read it again. I'm going to go read it again. And then realize, and then realize whatever hang-ups you've got about money – are not yours. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I posted something the other day on Facebook uh, just because I'm an idiot. And let me see if I can. Um, here we go. At some point in my late thirties, at some point in my late thirties, I realized that worrying about how much things cost was getting in the way of living the life that I wanted experiencing the things I desired and becoming the person I wanted to become. Sidebar, this is not in the post, but here's my thinking around this, right? Every time up until my late thirties, I was like, I want these things. I want to experience this. I want to drive that car. I want to travel. I want to donate to this charity. I want to be able to help here in the community. I want to have this house. I want to, this is the person I want to become, but oh my God, that's all going to cost so much. Right. So my brain would go to how much do things cost? This happens every 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet are concerned about how much things cost. I walk into a retailer. I never, at this point in my life, never negotiate or try and ask for a discount ever. No, ever. I just, it's, I just don't even think about it. Right. So I walk into a retailer to buy something. 99% of the time I go, cool, this is great. This is, I'm really happy with this. I'll take it. The person says, all right, well, look, it's normally $49, but we can do it for you right now for 45. I'm like, you fucking idiot. I just told you I want to buy it for full price. You're giving me a discount because you're concerned about how much it cost. I'm not concerned about how much it cost, but Hey, I'll take the $4 discount if you're going to give it to me. Like, I didn't ask for the discount. Right. So 
At some point in my late thirties, I realized that worrying about how much things cost was getting in the way of living the life I wanted, experiencing the things I desired and becoming the person I wanted to become. So I made a decision, a conscious, deliberate, intentional decision to stop putting my energy into how much things cost and instead made a list of the things and experiences I wanted and then focused my energy into how to pay for everything. Right? I don't care how much it costs. And I never say I can't afford it. I stopped saying I can't afford it years ago and I've trained my wife to not say it. What I say is, well, right now, our resources are allocated elsewhere. So let's put that on the next list. Never say I can't afford it. Right? I just don't have the resources right now. Our resources are allocated elsewhere. It's a much more abundant mindset. Much more abundant mindset. Yep. So think and grow rich. Because your thoughts, what you think about money is what will happen with money. If if you say, I don't have enough money to go on holidays, I would love to go to Australia and visit that idiot at Agency Mavericks, but I can't afford it, then that is true. And as long as you think you can't afford it, you can't afford it. And as long as you, if you're thinking in three years' time, I'd love to go to Australia, but I can't afford it, then you still will not be able to afford it because your subconscious will hear that message and will then go into overdrive to make sure that you can't afford it because your subconscious cannot live incongruently with your conscious. Now, I know this is very woo-woo, but whatever you think your subconscious will make true because your subconscious is a pretty stupid computer that just says yes or no, right? So if you go, shit, I'm a bit fat, I need to lose some weight, your subconscious goes, you're right, let's go have some more pizza. Let's stay fat and let's stay to need some to lose some weight because that's what you just said, I'm a bit fat, I need to lose some weight. That's true. And your subconscious will go into overdrive to keep you in that position. Whereas if you say, uh, for example, if you say, I'm losing five pounds, your subconscious will go, well, well we can't eat that pizza then because we're losing five pounds. Right. Troy's losing five kilos. Well, we can't drink that beer on a Tuesday night because Troy's losing five kilos. Right. So language is really important. The things that you think and the words that you say give your, self, your subconscious instructions on how to behave, right? <laughs> is this uh is this anonymous facebook user who's who's uh who's requested a refund who said that who said that who left that comment here we go i can see it yeah okay, a couple of questions i want to answer here before we bounce out uh that was thomas Thomas, okay, okay, okay. This is good. This is good. Yes, Damien, exactly. Shift from I want to I am, correct. And in fact, in fact, I've shifted from I am to Troy is. Third person, present tense. Yeah, third person, Troy present is. Tense, exactly. Right? Because the subconscious takes what pays way more attention to that. Right? So, uh, Thomas, yes, Sheila Heard. Damien, get on the phone to Sheila. <laughs> By the way, Damien is our new agency growth consultant here and is a legend, absolute legend, Damien. It's great to have you as part of the team. So reach out to Damien. I had a client sign on for a real estate website. The cost was 3800 and was paid up front. This was last year. Communication was great until July 2021. We sent mock-ups and the client was going to send some pictures for further edits to the mock-up. After July, there was no reply from multiple emails. Just the other day, she requested a refund. Eh, sorry. No, 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 no,
We don't refund. We, we don't do refund. nothing for free and we do nothing where we give money back. We finish the project that we started. Finish the project, right. So here's the choice. You've paid for the website. Your choice is this. We can complete the project as fully stated in the contract, no problem. Well, I'm sorry if you've changed your mind, you don't want a website, but we've done the work. There is no refund. Sorry. There's, I mean, there's, well, you've done the work. There is no refund. Right. I'm sorry you've changed your mind, but, you know, once you fly from Sydney to LA, right. business exactly. class, you which costs eight there, grand, there. you can't get off it, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, the terminal's called, what is it? Is it Tom Brady? It's the no, Tom Brady terminal. I don't terminal. think so. I don't it think is. so. I don't know. I'm not in LA, so I don't know. Listen, Damien, I'm what's the terminal in, in LA airport called? I don't think it's named after Tom Brady. LAX International Terminal. It's called Tom Bradley. Tom ah, Bradley. There you go. <laughs> Tom Bradley International Terminal, right? So uh, you get off at Tom Bradley and you walk up at the service desk and you go, you know what, man? I'll fucking change my mind. I don't want to come to LA. I want my eight and a half grand back and I want you to fly me back to Sydney. They're going to go, really? What school did you go to? Let me tell you how it works in the real world. No, we. I'm sorry. That's not going to happen. Right, I purchased some breakfast, but then I didn't eat it. Can I have a refund? Was there anything wrong with the breakfast? No, I just changed my mind. <laughs> Not <Sorry>. really hungry. <laughs> Not hungry. We cooked it. You paid. You don't eat it. That's up to you. Yep. Um, just I was just asking, what the hell's going on? Like, well, you hired us to do a project. We're doing the project. You paid us. You can't, like this is loot. This is this is ludicrous. You can't just yeah. tell us halfway through you don't want it anymore and ask for a refund. That's just I'm sorry. You, what's going on? I'm sorry you've changed your mind, but there are no refunds. Right. Hey, has this been fun? It has for me. Excellent. So I want to see you guys blocking time in your calendar. I want you to keep the conversation going here in the group, right? Uh, block time in your calendar where you're not allowed to work. Yes. There we go, Sheila. She saw my post and said it was like a door unlocked in my mind. Excellent. Uh, Martin, would you recommend prioritizing sales before having the full team to secure funds for expansion with the risk of not delivering top services to these clients? I recommend priority. Here's the way that I prioritize everything. Sales, team, ops, sales, team, processes, sales, team, ops. You can get to a million dollars a year in revenue by just shouting at your team in Slack. You do not need standard operating procedures if you are under half a mil or even a mil in revenue. It would be helpful once you get to half a million revenue to start having some processes, you do not need them to get to half a million year in revenue. I've seen it happen. All the, right? all the time. All the time. Yeah. So sales is priority number one. Remember, what is your job as a business owner? Don't run out of money and stay profitable. Sales is a number one priority. And the only reason people don't focus on sales is because they don't know how to. They're scared of it. It's like weird. There's all this kind of baggage and shit around sales. Just get into our training and our content and learn how to sell properly without being a sleazy douchebag, right? So sales first, then grow your team. At the same time that you bring on clients, grow your team and then worry about ops later. Worry about your processes later. I guarantee you, your team will design the processes for you, okay? Sales, team, ops. Okay, Martin? All right. We're going to bounce out of here. This has been the agency hour and four minutes. <laughs> All right. Used to be the agency almost hour. Now it's the agency hour overrun. Agency hour with time on. Uh, thanks for being a part of it, Pete. Keep right, sending man. me videos of the bass, dude, and I'll I'll uh, lay some guitar tracks over and send go. it back. There you It'll go. Be fun. Be Have fun. you? Do you record the bass at all? Uh, no, not really. No. Mm. Just like what I did to you. Just it's right mm. now. I'm just I'm doing that just to see my progress. That's it. Mm. I don't have awesome. any. I don't have the equipment to do all that stuff. Yet. Okay. Oh, there's a fun minimum, rabbit hole. <laughs> minimum, minimum, minimum viable effort. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, thanks for being a part of it, gang. Keep the conversation going in the Facebook group. Let us know what you need. And for those of you who are registered for the webinar, we'll see you in 25 minutes. All right. Have a great day. Bye for now.